Howdy folks, welcome to lesson 3 of the CompTIA Network Plus course. Now in case this is your first time watching one of these Network Plus videos of mine, this course is based on the N10-009 version of Network Plus, which is the version that was released in June 2024. Alrighty, and as for today's Network Plus lesson, as you can see, it's about Soho Networks. So if you don't know what that means, Soho is short for Small Office Home Office. Now before we jump into this lesson folks, if you haven't done it already, do me a favor and give this video a like. It really does help me a lot when you guys do that. And then obviously for you yourself, if you'd like to know when the next lesson of this course goes live, or maybe in one of my other content, maybe consider subscribing, then you won't miss it. Okay, enough of that. Let's go learn something. The first thing and the main thing we're going to be talking about regarding Soho networks is the router in a Soho environment, folks. Now, the first thing you'll notice about pretty much any Soho network is they all have what we call a local area network, or just LAN for short. A network in a single location is often described as a local area network, but there is not actually a specific size to a LAN, believe it or not. A LAN might consist of a small home network or, for example, maybe two or five machines. It might be a SOHO, you know, small office home office environment with 20 machines. Or it might even be a proper office building with 50 to 100 machines. Thousands of machines for all we know. You know, just to give you an idea, I've actually had quite a few companies where they had multiple buildings in the same office park which were connected to one another wirelessly. They had thousands of machines and yet it was part of the same LAN. So it's usually going to be in the same building, but it's not set in stone. Generally, as long as all the machines are in one location and all connected together via Ethernet or wireless, that is generally considered a LAN by definition, folks. Now, if we look specifically at the type of LAN you would find in a Soho environment, since this lesson focuses predominantly on Soho networks, the type of LAN you'll find in a Soho is a category of LAN with small number of computing hosts but typically rely on a single integrated appliance for local internet connectivity. Now, if you haven't made the connection yet, folks, the single integrated appliance I'm talking about here is the router. Now, with networks such as the internet, which is actually located in different geographic regions, but with shared links, uh, those are actually called wide area networks, or just WAN for short. So what we're saying here is, if you, for example, have multiple LANs, and you link them together over something like the internet. That is a WAN, W-A-N, WAN. These could be small, you know, they could be small lands, they can be big lands, it could just be two lands, it could be a hundred lands. The point here is, folks, if you were to link two or more lands together over the internet, you would have yourself what we call a WAN. So it doesn't matter if it's two or a hundred, as soon as you've got two LANs or more and you connect them over the internet, we call it a WAN. Now, the intermediate system powering Soho networks is usually described as a Soho router because one of its primary functions, guys, is to forward traffic between the LAN and the WAN. However, routing is actually just one of its functions. Yep. Okay, so let's take a deeper look into the Soho router. First of all, guys, like you probably already know, it's a multifunction network appliance. Now, what is meant by that is it combines the functions of a modem, a switch, a wireless access point, a router, and even a firewall all into one device. Yep, the average router can do all of that. Pretty nifty, right? Your router established a local area network, and this makes sense since, well, one of its functions is to act like a switch. So, since the router has so many functions and does so many things, let's use the OSI model so we can analyze some of these things. We'll start things off by looking at the physical layer, since that's layer 1 of the OSI model. So, if you guys don't know what the OSI model is, please go check the previous video. So, we are currently in lesson 3, in lesson 2 in this playlist. Um, I actually did a full discussion of the OSI model. It's pretty much all that video was about. So, there you'll see a description of what each layer actually does. Alright folks, now looking at the functions of the physical layer, if we look specifically at this 
Soho router. I should have a picture on the screen for you guys of that. It's predominantly things you can touch. It's not limited to that. A lot of people, you know, like I mentioned in the previous lesson, which was the OSI model, a lot of people are under the impression that the physical layer is exclusively just things you can touch, like a network cable and all that. Yes, but you've got to remember when they established the OSI model, back then we predominantly only worked with cables, but now the physical layer can actually be wireless. I don't mean the wireless access point per se, uh, but it could actually be the wireless session. Now you can basically compare that wireless frequency or the session with the cables normally. Now looking at the physical layer functions, finally getting back to my point, RJ45 ports for cabled network connections. You'll see there's five of them. Um, the first one is your WAN there on the left. You can see it on the WAN on the left. That is to basically have your connection come into your router. You know, it's coming in there and going out there. And the four extra ports on the right that's labeled there, that is so that devices can connect directly to the router using what we call a network cable. And then you would normally plug that in with an RJ45 cable. Should you potentially have more than four devices, then you can obviously go and plug a cable into one of these four ports and split it even further with what we call a switch or something like a switch. This can be an eight port switch, 16 port, 32 port switch, you never know. But at the end of the day, it's gonna give you more ports, which means you can plug in more devices into this router directly or indirectly, and they're gonna all have internet access. At least that's the idea. These routers have radio antennas for wireless signaling, and that signal that it establishes between one device and another, that actually forms part of layer one, guys. Believe it or not, it's the weirdest thing, but it does. And then also, this device is a modem for WAN connectivity, just in case you didn't figure that one out. All right, guys, now we are pretty much done with the physical layer there of the router. Now, looking at this from another perspective, layer two perspective, the data link layer. So looking at this from a data link layer perspective, the functions would be Ethernet switch. So if you guys watched my OSI model video, you would know that a switch normally falls under layer two, which is the data link layer. The router can act as a switch. So if you don't have a switch at home or you only have two or three devices at home, there's no real need to go and get yourself a switch then but the router will actually act like a switch. So you, your family, your friends inside your home environment can connect to one another through this router because it acts like a switch. Now you can do this via the RJ45 ports, but the fact of the matter is it's actually not just limited, right? They can actually go and connect via wireless as well. So one of your family members inside your home or your small office might be connected to the router via cable. And the next person might be connected to the router via wireless, but they are still technically on the same network and they can still communicate with one another through that device, which is acting like a switch. Now, speaking of wireless, it actually also acts like a wireless access point. So most routers will have at least one antenna. They could potentially have more than one, so it's not limited to one. Some of them have none. Most will have at least one. Now, I've seen routers of two antennas. I've seen some of them have three antennas. Hell, guys, I've seen some routers of six antennas. They're very rare, but they're out there. So it can act like a wireless access point. You can go and implement a Wi-Fi standard if you want to go and do that. You can go and connect stations in a wireless LAN. So we call that a WLAN normally. A wireless LAN, we refer to it as a WLAN. So if you have laptops, tablets, and phones that you want to go and connect to the router wirelessly, yes, this can be done, even of desktop PCs. Now, natively, a desktop PC can't connect wirelessly to a router, but you can go and install what we call a wireless card. Not a topic here right now. And what the router also does, and you would notice if you've watched the OSI video, is media access control hardware addresses identify each interface. So let's just say Mac hardware addresses identify each interface. All right, I'm gonna move you guys into the next layer, network layer functions. So the network layer functions, I think what I'm gonna do is, we'll have the router in the middle here, and I am gonna go and label this as private and public, inside and outside. So on the right hand side, I'll label this as the inside of your network. So that's going to be inside your home or inside your office. On the left-hand side of this router, I'm going to label that as outside your network. That's the public side. So the inside, we call that private. And all the IP addresses in there, you'll, you'll call those private IP addresses as well. The outside, we call that public. And the IP address you or the user will have there is a public IP address. I'm going to also give the router itself its own little IP address here in the middle. So there we go. It's normally going to be .1. Not set in stone, but that's generally the default. I'm gonna add a bunch of computers here on the right. It's not up to scale. I'm just gonna add four completely random machines here on the right hand side for you guys, just to put this into perspective so you can see what the heck we're talking about. And on each of these machines will have their own little IP address. So I'm gonna make the one at the top dot four. 
um, the one below that dot five dot six followed by dot seven so they just change by one digit every time and away on the left I'm gonna put this little image of a globe and we're gonna call that the internet it's not my best work but hey it's something and I'm gonna give it an IP address I'm gonna make up some public IP address there I'm sucking that out of my thumb completely made up so there we go there's our image so on the right hand side of this router guys I'm gonna draw a line down this router just to make it easier to understand so there we go there's a line down the middle of this router on the right hand side that is inside your home or your office on the left side of the screen that is the outside that is the public that is the internet now each of the machines inside your network whether they be a desktop a laptop or a tablet or phone they will have an ip address which is considered unique and it's called a private ip address it does not matter if you or someone entered the ip address manually on a device which we call static or fixed and it does not matter if they got the ip address automatically from something called the dhcp which could be built into your router or it could be run from a server either way wherever you got your ip from inside your home or your office it's considered a private ip address folks now as soon as these people go through your router to the outside world which we can call the internet in this case they all actually share the same ip address believe it or not if you have multiple machines in your home guys right now or if you're the office right now and there's multiple machines yes inside they will all have their own unique ip address but if you go check the public ip address of these machines you'll find that they all have the same public ip address there's benefits to that there's drawbacks to that so a drawback would be if one of the people in your home or your office goes to a website online and they get themselves banned or blocked and let's say that site blocks them via their public ip address that's a problem because if now someone else in that network goes to that same website someone innocent perhaps they will also be accidentally blocked now that's a problem but if you've got a resource online let's say in a cloud on some place like Microsoft Azure and you've got a firewall there instead of having to go and allow so many IP addresses you just need to go and allow one your company's public IP address you just need to allow that it's not the best security but it is still security nonetheless you only do it once and it's going to automatically allow everybody in your company building because they all share the same public IP address guys that is one of the solutions to the fact that we're running out of IP addresses in the world you'll see we've got IP version 4 we've got IP version 6 not a topic today but IP version 6 is one of the solutions to the fact that we're actually running out of IP addresses and the fact that we can go and shove all these private IP addresses into a pipeline and then you'll all have the same public IP address it's called overload sparsely called NAT you know there's, there's many names we can call it but that's that's deep Cisco territory and other territory then anyway hopefully this makes a little bit more sense to you guys and then I'm gonna move on to one extra layer here before we call this video quits transport and application layer function so it's actually two layers so first of all guys I'm gonna give you guys a picture on the screen it's a random router it's not the best it's not the most expensive it's actually a very old picture but it will do for now I can unfortunately not tell you guys that hey a router will look like this or it will look like that because every one of them kind of looks different it depends on the brand it depends on the model in essence though they've got the same concepts if you understand one you'll be able to manage on another one you'll know you'll know more or less what you're looking for and more or less where to go and dig for it so one of the first things we'll talk about here is filtering between public and private zones so you can go and do things like for example specify um, you're going to allow or block rules for IP addresses you can go and say you know what the following IP addresses are not allowed to go outside or the following IP addresses are not allowed to come into your networks it's a I mean, that's that's the purpose of a firewall if you think about it it's it's a firewall a firewall allows you to block and allow ports it allows you to block and allow IP addresses URLs that is just some of the many many functions a firewall has and on your router the firewall section of the router you can actually go and block or allow certain things like IP addresses you can go and specify port numbers you know which is layer 4 you can go and do that as 2 you can go and block allow that and if you really want to I can even go and throw in you URLs which is website addresses all that in there you can go and choose whether people need to authenticate if they want to access your wireless network so that on its own sounds very fancy and complicated but what I actually mean is you can go and put a password on your Wi-Fi so what is your SSID password or your Wi-Fi password you know depending on the router you've got and the brand and the model they might call it your Wi-Fi password it might be labeled as SSID password but what is the password so that people can gain access you can also go and protect the Soho router management interface something we'll speak about more later on this was actually discussed in A plus if you guys watched my A plus course on the, on the channel by the way I've got an A plus course on my channel in case you guys didn't know I doubt you're gonna want to watch that if you're already on N plus territory 
But protecting the Soho router management interface is basically where the main administrator would log in. That would be you guys. So if you want to access a router, you're going to normally open a browser, a browser of your choice. You're going to type in the router's IP address in that browser. We would normally go and type in the URL. It's going to land on a splash page of sorts, which is basically the landing page, the login page of that router. Looks like a website, but it's not a website. It's going to ask you for a username and a password. The username is usually by default going to be something like admin. The password by default will either be blank or also the word admin or something like admin 1234, which is very unsecure. A lot of ID people know this default passwords. So it's always a good idea to go and change the default password. You don't have to change the default username. I suppose you can, but nobody does that. But you need to change the default password, guys. Because there's a lot of people out there that knows what these default passwords are. And if you don't, you can actually very easily find them on Google. Honest to goodness, you can. It's very easy to find a default password for any brand, any model on Google. It's not as difficult, guys. All right, folks, so that is today's lesson. I hope you guys have learned something. It's not the most exciting topic, but unfortunately, we do need to cover it nonetheless. Some of the topics are going to be fun. Some of them, not so much, but we still have to cover it because a lot of you guys want to go write the exam. So, yeah, you need to know this stuff. If you guys haven't done it already, please do your homie a favor here and point the like button. It does help me a lot, like I said in the beginning of the video. Um, if you're wondering how it helps me, well, because YouTube will promote the video more. And when they promote it more, more people will see it that cannot afford training. So we're going to be helping people out there that cannot afford to pay for training. And I know a lot of you guys probably can't afford to pay for training. So you probably know what it's like to be in that boat. If you'd like to know when Lesson 4 goes live or when one of my other videos goes live, like I said in the beginning, maybe consider subscribing. Join the party and then at least you'll know when the videos goes live. Before we call it quits on the video, guys, just a shout out and thank you to all of you guys sponsoring the channel. So even those of you just clicking on the thanks button below the video, I know it's not always available in all countries, but thank you for that. I have received those donations. Thank you to those of you that's just buying me a coffee or a milkshake. Um, to those of you that's Patreons, those of you doing PayPal donations, all of that can be found in the video description down below, by the way. So if you'd like to support the channel in some sort of way, so I can keep making content like this, you can find that information all in the video description down below, guys. So here's a list of all the Patreon sponsors. Thank you very much, guys. Appreciate you guys very much. Here's a list of all the PayPal sponsors. Thank you very much, guys. Appreciate. And then lastly, guys, if you did not know, I'm sure you'll know by now, there's a Discord server for this channel. So if you guys want to join the Discord server, if you know what Discord is, feel free to join it. It's completely for free. It's an IT community of like-minded people like you and me. And if you've got questions about this course or any other course, or if you'd just like to assist other people in IT, that's the place to be. Lots of fun people there. All right, folks, I think that's it for today. I will see you guys in lesson four of the CompTIA Network Plus course.